think it's really important that we're having this seminar on World Fisheries Day because it was actually a day that was established by uh, fisheries movements back in 1997. Um, and there are, as we speak, there are fisheries organizations around the world who are uh, having rallies and events uh, in, their, in their different local contexts, which I think is quite exciting and keeps the spirit of the day uh, alive. Um, so I'm going to discuss a bit about what my PhD research focuses on, um, which is more fisheries politics at a global level. Um, and I'm particularly interested in understanding the kind of key issues, social movements, and political events um, that are uh, at the center of these politics. Um, so, um, I'm mainly going to talk about the kind of broader framing of my PhD research, and I'm, I'm trying to develop a sort of better way to understand uh, fisheries politics more holistically. Um, both historically, but also um, in today's more uh, increasingly complex context. Um, and I'm particularly interested in the role of small-scale fishers movements um, as, a, as key actors who are engaging in these fisheries politics. Um, and I think understanding their role becomes even more critical in this blue economy era that we've entered into. Um, I think that the emergence of this era really highlights um, an even more urgent need to try to grapple with the increasingly complex uh, spaces of fisheries um, and ocean resources and figure out also how um, small-scale fisheries can be protected and prioritized despite the many threats that are also emerging in this blue economy era. Um, and I think um, we need to think about the role also that fishers movements might play in this blue economy uh, agenda. Uh, so how can they engage with this new agenda and what are the different forms that this engagement might take? Um, so I'm proposing basically to explore fisheries politics via these three overlapping spheres. So first it's the key issues or the topics of concern that are uh, propelling fisheries politics. And then there's the key social movements or global alliances which are um, engaging with these particular issues. And then there are the key uh, political events or moments of interaction where these movements are participating. Um, so yeah, as the politics around globalized systems of both food and climate change um, become more complex, uh, they're also becoming much more contentious. Um, and this is mainly because there are constantly uh, new actors, issues, and agendas emerging every day. Um, it's making it increasingly unclear who is doing what, uh, how, and why. Um, and as concerns about climate change continue to grow, we also see uh, mitigation and adaptation <coughs> initiatives popping up everywhere. Um, these are often being presented as sustainable development initiatives or uh, more environmentally friendly ways to stimulate economic growth. Um, and this approach has become quite common in the context of land-based initiatives um, but more recently, freshwater and green spaces, um, places like mangroves, marshes, and shallow coastal areas, um, are also increasingly being targeted uh, for sustainable development projects. And many investors uh, tend to see these spaces as kind of ownerless uh, last frontier for extracting natural resources. Um, they're often also seen as kind of less contentious uh, spaces than these more land-based projects. Uh, which have tended to cut off local communities' access to uh, forests and farmland. Um, and we see more and more examples of things like marine protected areas and blue carbon initiatives, which do unfortunately often end up uh, separating small-scale fishers from uh, their livelihoods. Um, so within this kind of more broad global context, the role of small-scale fishers movements becomes even more important because they are already engaging with these three kind of overlapping sets of food, climate, and fisheries politics. Um, and these are issues that small-scale fishers are dealing with every day in their local contexts. Um, and I think that looking more closely at these linkages can kind of contribute to three things. Um, so first, it can broaden the scope of food politics um, beyond land and agriculture to also include the implications of uh, fishers, aquatic resources, and spaces in, the, in this kind of broader global food system. Um, it can also extend debates around climate politics by exploring um, the interconnections of 
land and water spaces and also the impacts of mitigation initiatives on fishers themselves. And it can also strengthen um, existing bodies of fisheries research by integrating more insights and alternatives uh, from fishers' experiences. Uh, so, um, why do these fisheries politics actually matter? Um, in the last decade or so, there's really been this re-emergence of interest in the politics around the global food system. Um, and research and debates on food politics have typically focused more on agriculture and farmers um, and how things like industrialization and privatization are causing small-scale farmers to lose access to resources and livelihoods. But there's been much less attention to the fisheries aspect of this. Um, and I think that this chart actually from the, from the Google Books database kind of gives an interesting illustration of this. It basically compiles um, uh, the data from a, a whole library of books that have been published within a certain time frame. And when you do a search for key uh, keywords like fishers and, and fisheries in comparison with farmers and agriculture, you see how much more uh, these more land-based issues are being talked about. Um, so for small-scale farmers, this interest has contributed to uh, increasing <coughs> public attention for the issues that are affecting them, and this has also helped to open up um, uh, a range of new avenues for them to engage with policymakers, NGOs, and researchers. And it's also helped to increase the visibility of global peasant movements like Olivia Campesina, uh, because these debates highlight the need for uh, radical new alternatives for addressing the crises uh, in the food sector. And food sovereignty is actually a prominent example of an alternative which was first constructed by Olivia Campesina as a movement and in recent years has uh, made it all the way to be adopting it, adopted into uh, research and policy discussions as a kind of possible way forward for the global food system. Um, but in much of these discussions around food politics, fishers have typically been uh, absorbed into um, agrarian or peasant categories, which I think really limits our understanding of the particular um, complex set of issues that they face. And food sovereignty processes and debates um, have also tended to have quite weak engagement with fishers, meaning that there's been much less attention to understanding what food sovereignty might look like in the fisheries sector. Um, and although the actors that have been engaging with food sovereignty uh, have always considered <coughs> fishers to be allies, uh, there's only recently been a kind of much more concerted effort toward establishing stronger alliances between uh, farmers and fishers movements. Um, and also in research on fisheries, particularly in an academic context, there's been a lot of work done on uh, more fisheries governance and management aspects, but there's been much less engagement with uh, organized fishers movements, um, despite the fact that these movements are actually participating in uh, global, national, and local political spaces and have also been key contributors in developing uh, international guidelines like the small-scale fisheries guidelines. Um, okay, so this is like a kind of a visualization of these three spheres that I was talking about. Um, so how can we really explore these fisheries politics as, as it's obviously a very complex kind of set of issues. Um, so there are three key spheres. Uh, first is to identify the issues that are propelling these fisheries politics. So these include things like privatization and extractivism of fisheries resources and fishers' rights being uh, ignored or infringed upon. And small-scale fishers' movements um, have been shaping their political agendas and making demands around these issues for several decades already. Um, Yet these concerns are becoming even more intensified by the inter uh, intersections between increasing privatization in both the fisheries and global food systems, uh, and also an increasing focus on climate change discourse. Um, and the resulting exclusion and dispossession of small-scale fishers from accessing uh, fishing territories and resources can be illustrated by three kind of key examples that, uh, that have been emerging. Um, so the first example is that the uh, expansion of the industrial food system has really enlarged uh, privatization and extractivism in fisheries, uh, dominated by large-scale industrial fishing companies. And um, 
privatization initiatives such as uh, individual fishing quotas have been one of the key factors in this, which is mainly because uh, large-scale fishing fleets tend to have the capital to get extensive access to resources via quota systems, which often ends up uh, meaning that these quotas become uh, quite concentrated in the hands of a few uh, large companies. Then the second example is that capital accumulation um, has extended much further now beyond uh, forests and agricultural lands and into new frontiers, particularly the fishery sector, um, largely through the commodification of nature. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, these freshwater and marine spaces have increasingly become the target of investment uh, and sustainable development initiatives, especially due to the rise in these uh, more land-based uh, mitigation projects and the, the conflict that has emerged around them. Then the third example is that the politics of climate change are accelerating the spread of <coughs> mitigation initiatives, which um, tend to further restrict access to aquatic resources. And these are kind of uh, seen as new forms of control, um, which have worsened existing exclusion uh, of small-scale fishers caused by decades of uh, privatization and industrialization. Um, and blue growth initiatives, for example, um, have been presented as kind of a win-win uh, solution that promises to boost economic growth, uh, protect uh, natural resources, while also providing benefits for all. But unfortunately, many small-scale fishers end up actually losing access to more resources um, and tend to be excluded from uh, the benefits of these initiatives. Um, so then the second sphere is tracking the social movements who are engaging with these issues. Um, so the issues that I just highlighted are really central to the struggle of these particular movements, and they're concerned with issues of inclusion, human and collective rights, democratizing access and control of natural resources, and the unequal impacts of climate change. And two of the movements which are central in fisheries politics at a, at a more global level are the World Forum of Fisher Peoples, or the WFFP, and the World Forum of Fish Harvesters and Fish Workers, the WFF. Um, and uh, these two movements have been representing small-scale fisher people around the world for the last <coughs> 20 years. Um, and the role in fisheries politics can partially be understood by three uh, important developments. So first, um, fishers' movements appear to be uh, internalizing the increasing convergence of these fisheries, food, and climate issues, which I just highlighted, and uh, are aligning their political agendas accordingly. Uh, for example, movements have recently begun engaging with food sovereignty as a kind of key analytical and mobilizing tool for pursuing food and climate justice. Um, and they're also engaging directly with issues of private property and ocean grabbing uh, in some of their advocacy work as well. And then the second development is that uh, traditional, uh, more traditionally agrarian global, move global movements like Lilia Campesina um, and platforms such as the International Planning Committee for Food Sovereignty uh, are increasingly internalizing uh, the fisheries aspect of food and climate crises as well. So exa examples of this engagement includes uh, the participation of WFFP and Olivia Campesina in uh, their respective international assemblies, which they both held at different moments in 2017, and also the establishment of uh, an International Planning Committee uh, fisheries working group. And the third important development is that uh, key UN bodies such as the FAO and the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change um, have further internalized fisheries in their work as well. So examples of this include um, more active participation uh, of the WFFP and the WFF in international spaces, uh, particularly since 2008, um, such as the Committee on Fisheries and the Committee on Food Security. And there's also been greater attention uh, to the protection of, um, of, of these spaces for movements to participate. Um, so uh, the third, um, oh yeah, so and there's also been greater attention to uh, aquatic spaces and resources uh, in UN agendas as well. Um, the most common uh, example of this would be the SDG uh, Goal 14, Life Below Water. And within that, there's also a target to provide access for small-scale and artisanal fishers to marine resources and markets. 
Um, so then finally, the third sphere um, is following the events where movements are participating. And these are key uh, political pro uh, processes which each have many events uh, as part of them where movements are engaging with these key issues, collaborating with other actors, and also building alliances with other social movements. Um, so the first is the Committee on Fisheries, which is a body of the FAO, and it's currently the only international forum that examines fisheries and aquaculture issues, negotiates global agreements, and also makes uh, recommendations to the governments which are members of this space. And in the last Kofi session in 2018, there were 25 participants from the WFFP and the WFF, as well as 10 representatives from uh, support organizations working with these movements um, that were participating in the formal <coughs> Kofi session uh, as members of the IPC. The second is the Committee on World Food Security, which serves as a UN forum for reviewing and following up on food security policies. And in the last CFS session, which was actually just held last month in Rome, uh, there were about 60 organizations participating via the Civil Society and Indigenous Peoples Mechanism, or the CSM, and this included WFFP and WFF, uh, which both have representatives that are participating in the CSM's Coordinating Committee. Um, and then the third is the Conference of the Parties on Climate Change, which is the kind of principal decision-making body of the UNFCCC. And an example here, um, because in this space there's much less formal space uh, allowed for social movements, but um, during the COP21 in 2015, uh, there was a parallel People's Climate Summit, which was organized and took place in several locations around Paris. Um, and civil society groups held meetings and workshops in this space. There was quite, a, quite an impressive number of uh, social movements participating there. And many WFFP and WFF members participated in this summit and also co-organized events on the global convergence of land and water struggles together with Livia Capucina. And they also had their own side event, which was looking at blue carbon as a kind of false solution to climate change. So um, just to quickly conclude, um, what are the possible implications of this kind of research? Um, and in addition to these analytical uh, points, which, um, which I was already discussing about kind of connecting debates around fisheries, food, and climate politics, um, I think that there could also be several social implications. So um, more research on fishers' movements can contribute important perspectives and knowledge from fishers themselves and also gener generate critical insights that may be useful in strengthening or expanding more practical <coughs> pursuits toward uh, fisheries or blue justice. Um, then through kind of more engaged research approaches, um, this type of research can also offer opportunities for more collaborations with social movements and to kind of collectively develop new ways for fishers' voices to emerge on key issues in, uh, in research. Um, and it may also serve as a useful tool for fishers movements themselves to also bring, gain critical insights into their positions, contributions, and, and also possible weaknesses uh, in different spheres of politics, while also identifying um, new ways to try to move forward. <coughs>